everyone, my name is Julian Sambru. I'm the current maintainer of Dagger.jl, which is the subject of this presentation. I'm currently working at the MIT Julia Lab on HPC applications. I'd like to thank the Julia Lab, as well as Valentin Sharavi and Shashi Gouda for mentoring me and assisting with Dagger.jl maintainership. Thanks also to the many contributors to Dagger.jl who have helped shape it into what it is today. Some of you may have heard about Dagger, maybe from the community forums or from the excellent 2016 JuliaCon talk from Shashi introducing Dagger. Let's briefly talk about what Dagger is and what it isn't. Dagger is a distributed computing framework built on top of the distributed standard library, but Dagger is not necessarily a replacement for distributed. Dagger has a scheduler that is smart enough to saturate Julia workers with work and simultaneously minimize data transfer costs. Unlike distributed, Dagger is designed around functional programming and represents operations as a directed acyclic graph, or DAG. Dagger supports executing tasks on multiple processors and multiple threads, as well as on accelerators like GPUs. Dagger was originally designed for HPC use cases, and we're continuing that work, as well as expanding Dagger into new domains. When and why would you want to use Dagger instead of distributed? This all depends on what you're trying to accomplish, but in general, Dagger is better in the following situations. You have a large, complicated application with many moving parts running across multiple threads or processes. Your application needs to seamlessly scale to arbitrary numbers of processors. You want to support special hardware like GPUs and fancy network fabrics like InfiniBand when they're available to the user. You don't want to manage all the intricacies of doing efficient work scheduling, such as data transfer optimization, workload balancing, and exploiting every possible degree of parallelism available in your application. You might want to do checkpointing of intermediate results in your application so that your application can be stopped and resumed partway through a large computation. You want easy access to visualizations and debugging information about where your tasks are being scheduled and how well utilized your processes are at any given point in time. All of this and more is available with Dagger today, although certain features are still a work in progress. Hopefully by now you're at least interested in seeing how to access all of these features. Thankfully, Dagger tries to be simple and stay out of your way as much as possible. Let's start off by creating a 10,000 by 1,000 matrix, and let's do some operations on it. We're going to do about the same sort of operation twice to show a little bit of parallelism. Notably, Julia doesn't exploit this parallelism because it can't see it ahead of time. So that's great. Let's see how one would do this with Dagger. It's as simple as adding dagger.at spawn in front of most expressions that you wish to parallelize. This will take a moment. What Dagger is doing is wrapping this expression in what's called an eager thunk, or just a thunk. Uh, this is very similar to threads.at spawn, where you create a task around a computation that's going to be done, and it's done lazily in the background. So in this case now, w is an eager thunk, representing a computation that's happening in the background in Dagger's scheduler. So now we can go ahead and finish the rest of these computations that we did in Julia using dagger.at-spawn. And now X and Y are executing potentially in parallel. Now, this is going to be a slight departure from what we've been doing, but due to issues with the at spawn macro, which will be fixed in the future, for certain broadcasting functions like dot star, we have to use dagger dot spawn the function. However, the functionality is equivalent. And we can go ahead and fetch our results. See the result of Z, um, which includes the, the inputs X and Y, which came uh, with inputs of W. And we can fetch this value multiple times. We can wait on it. In that case, um, it's done. And we can fetch any of the other variables that are in our computation. So um, it's pretty easy to work with the results that you get from dagger.at spawn. So 
In many cases, you can swap out a threads.at spawn call for a dagger.at spawn call, and everything will just work. A side note, if you've used dagger before, you might be wondering, where's the delayed call, as in dagger.delayed? This API is called the lazy API, and we don't plan to keep this as the main API going forward. The eager API, which is dagger.at spawn that we've demonstrated, is the so-called eager API, and this is the one that we're going to be recommending that users use going forward, and may eventually replace the functionality in dagger.delayed. So how does Dagger's scheduler work? Very simply, Dagger's scheduler, which is called SCH in the code base, don't ask me how to pronounce that, keeps a directed acyclic graph for DAG internally, which maps the relationship between tasks that have been added to the scheduler. When all of the input tasks in the graph for a given task have been executed or otherwise satisfied, maybe via throwing an error, the scheduler will then schedule that next task to execute on some worker in the cluster. In the example that we just showed, X and Y are inputs to Z, so Z will wait until X and Y have been executed and the results are available before Z is scheduled. This probably sounds reasonably obvious, but these ordering details are what keeps the scheduler busy and allows it to express reasonably complex programs. How is this any different from what PMAP and friends do? First of all, PMAP has no way to express data flow dependencies. Tasks, ex tasks execute independently of each other and may be scheduled in an arbitrary order. This is great for map operations, but it's insufficient for just about anything else. Secondly, PMAP doesn't schedule more than one task per worker, which sometimes is what you want and other times exhibits poor performance. I'll show how you can adjust the sort of tasks per worker knob later on in the presentation. And how about distributed? You can, of course, express arbitrarily complex programs with it. Dagger's built on top of distributed. This is true, but with distributed, you also need to manually ensure proper ordering, error handling and propagation, and much more. If you were to implement a distributed.at spawn that has similar semantics to threads.at spawn, you'd basically end up re-implementing Dagger. This brings up a key point. Dagger doesn't really do anything special it just builds abstractions, idiomatic APIs, and a DAG scheduler on top of distributed. You could build the core of Dagger in a few afternoons, and it would probably look pretty close to Dagger's own source code. Of course, Dagger has a ton of features and powerful abstractions built on top, which is what really differentiates it from your run-of-the-mill DAG scheduler. But before we get to these fancy features, which you might or might not use for most programs, I want to show you what a simple but useful and realistic application looks like when built from the ground up with Dagger. I figured I'd show something that I actually wanted for myself, a security camera monitoring system. See, I have a bunch of security cameras set up at home, since we're in a pretty rough neighborhood, so I wanted to be able to monitor my home and keep a record of what goes on. There exists a program called Motion that can do camera recording, motion detection, and serves a basic web UI, but it doesn't really do everything I want and I don't want to have to modify a lot of C code to accomplish my goals. Thankfully, Julia has a wonderful set of image processing libraries, so this should be pretty easy to do. All right, so here's the demo. Uh, so we have this driver script here called run.jl, and it does a few basic things. So it loads distributed, uh, revised so that we can incrementally build this thing, and then I have a package called security server. So this is going to be where all of our logic is. And we're loading that on, in this case, all threads, but this applies to multiprocessing as well. Um, so the point of this is to take a few camera streams, whether they're network camera streams, webcam streams, uh, video files that work on anything, and do some transformations to it, do some motion detection, and just for testing purposes, write it out onto a into a window so we can actually see what this looks like. So I've got two camera feeds loaded up. Um, we'll see them in just a second. But the way we're going to actually render these to the screen, we're going to use the minifb.jl package, a uh, great simple frame buffer library. Um, I've got a little um, keyboard callback that we'll use so that we have some controls. Um, I'll get to that in a little bit. And then we're just setting some various little things, and then we have a function to actually 
do the main loop. And the main thing we are really going to look at is this security server dot update buffer. That's where gonna, all of our logic is really going to be. Um, so let's take a look at that real quick. So have a few things commented out that we'll add, but what we have here basically, um, it takes G, which is the frame buffer. It's just an array of um, RGB values, and then a width and height of the frame buffer. Um, not really necessary, you can get them from the size, but regardless. Um, so we calculate a, um, so first we have to load some cameras. So I have a file uh, called cameras.jl and it basically is just a set of name tuples, um, a vector of name tuples, excuse me, where we have the URL and then we have a just user defined name for the cameras. And I have two of them in here. Um, I'm not going to show it because it includes some passwords so that we can access the cameras. Um, then we have a vector for the FFmpeg handles. Uh, they'll be just C pointers. And then the sizes of the cameras, which we'll have to auto detect. So um, the first thing we do, so we say, OK, for all of the cameras that we have, let's calculate a size. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to stack these vertically, one on top of the other. And then next, we're going to actually read a frame from each camera. So this is update buffer is the loop. So at the top of this, we, we read a frame, and then we'll process that frame. And then at the next loop, we'll read a new frame from each camera, etc. So this is some basic logic, just so we can store a set of frames so that we can kind of go backwards and forwards um, in a short little time span. Um, around the current time um, kind of like almost like allowing you to do um, like basic video editing that functionality is not implemented but you can imagine so <clears throat> let's pull up the actual rendering of this so that now we have a little bit of context um, I'm gonna put it right here just so we can see what it looks like there's a little bit of artifacts don't mind that that's just from the cameras um, but we can see one camera at the top, just in my office, it's not a wonderful view. And then the bottom image is from uh, my room upstairs where I have chinchillas. And so you can see their cages. Um, so we can see that we have these vertically stacked. There's some watermarks from the cameras themselves. Um, and we're going to put this out of the way for right now, but that's what we're going to be working on. So what we have to do is we resize the frames to the new size because the frame buffer um, and the portion of the frame buffer that the cameras are going to get are different than the sizes of the cameras themselves. So we use the um, image transformations library to do some resizing. And then we have our main update function here, which just goes through all of the cameras and then writes them at the appropriate position into the frame buffer. Um, and then at the end, we just have, um, we're storing some frames and making sure that we don't store too many of them. So one thing we can do, you may not be able to see it too well, but what we can do is we can actually pause this with space and then we can go backwards and forwards among the frames with the left and right keys and we should be able to see in the timestamps um, as we go backwards and forwards. And you can see we're going backwards a bit. It's not perfect, but it does work. Great. So now the point of this demo is how do we add dagger to this? How do we make this efficient? Say we have a hundred cameras and we want to do this in parallel. Say we have a big beefy compute server. How do we do this? Well, the first thing we can do, so we can't um, easily, if you want to do multi-processing, we can't easily read the frames in parallel right now because um, we might accidentally, Dagger might accidentally send the pointer for the FFmpeg handle over to another processor across the network and that is invalid. But we can start at these resized frames with dagger.at spawn. And what we're going to do is, 
I'm going to immediately fetch all of these because we're going to use this for um, some other stuff later down the line. Okay. There we go. And now that can execute in parallel. And now what we also want to do is take this guy here and also do a dagger.at spawn um, where um, we'll use just the function spawn. And we'll take in an index and a frame and just need a few little adjustments for this for IDX frame in enumerate resized frames. Great. And then we can do this. Um, missing a parenthesis. Yes, thank you, revise. All right. So now, this should still be processing. And let's see. Yep, still running, no problem. Seems to be going a little bit faster. Let's see if we can actually see. Yes, so we can see one Julia thread here, and then we can see another Julia thread here. Now, they're not doing a whole lot right now, but there is some multiprocessing going on, but it's not enough to really saturate the second Julia thread. So most of it's just happening on one of the threads, and that's fine. So let's go ahead and now add some more functionality to this. So let's add some basic uh, motion detection. So I have a motion file, so we can uncomment that guy, and we can, so what we wanna do to do this is we're going to first use the image transformations library and we're going to do a Gaussian blur um, and what this will do so there is some noise maybe from power line frequencies or something like that um, in the image if you look closely so what we're going to do is we're going to smooth over that um, raw frames and um, what we also are going to do, so I'm going to just write this out and then I'm going to explain what all is going on. So what we're doing here, I'm just storing some frames for later. Um, and the reason we need to do this is because we need to keep an extra frame. So when we do the motion detection, we basically need to keep one frame from the previous iteration to compare against because we're going to do a pixel wide um, difference per pixel and then approximately summate the differences. And that'll give us like a rough idea of how much motion there is um, in the image frame to frame. Okay, and we're gonna run this one also through Dagger. Great, and then I'm just gonna make sure we set a frame. Great, okay. And this should work. Now, um, these blurred frames, we actually should be able to see these in the output image if we change things so that we actually output that directly here. There we go, and now we can see it's a little bit grainier. You can't exactly see all the details. Um, we can take a quick look at the motion.jl file, and it's pretty simple. It defines that pre motion frames, just declare it any for ease, and this is just my made up motion detection um, algorithm. It's not great, but it works fine. So, and of course, you know, you could do whatever you want with these. You can use machine learning or OpenCV or some special thing like that. But, you know, that's out of scope for this. Um, so that's great. So we have, we have motion values, but we can't actually see them. Um, so let's first do this. So we don't need our blurred frames here being on the output. But what we can do is we can add watermarks. 
So watermarks will basically um, let us annotate on the frames what basically whatever information we want to put on there. Um, and the way we're going to do that is with the uh, Cairo library, um, great C library that we have excellent bindings for. Um, and it it's single threaded, so we definitely want to use Dagger to parallelize it so that it's not super slow. Um, so, all right, we've got that, and then we've just got to include the watermarking functionality, which I'll show in just a minute, and then instead of raw frames, we'll actually show these watermarked frames. Great, and let's see if this works. We should get some watermarks momentarily, and there we go. So now we can see um, for each of these images, so we see office and chillas as in chinchillas, and these are being pulled from that camera struct that I included that I mentioned before. And then we have our motion values here just rendered as text, really simple. Um, <clears throat> and you can imagine if you're saving this to disk for later analysis that um, that might be really useful for knowing which camera you're looking at if they kind of have similar views. Um, so this is the watermarking functionality very basic Cairo stuff, um, and this is called once per camera um, in parallel. So let's see how we're doing in terms of um, performance. So we're actually seeing now Julia is using both of its threads reasonably heavily. Before we were only using about 5% of the second thread, now we're using about 65%, and the main thread is at 100%. It's, it's fully processing everything. Um, no time spent waiting. Um, yeah, so that's about it. Um, I will post the source code for this at um, before JuliaCon, and hopefully it's useful for you. So that's all there is to writing an application with Dagger. Of course, for the sake of simplicity, I didn't show off many features that Dagger has available. Let's briefly discuss some of them. Distributed arrays. Dagger provides a distributed array called the D array which is a lazy chunking array type which calls Dagger automatically for many common operations such as matrix multiply, transpose, maps and reductions, and more. With the D-Array, it's possible to build up a lazily constructed graph of operations and then launch the whole thing at once. In the future, Dagger Scheduler will gain the ability to optimize these lazy array operations to exploit more parallelism and to eliminate redundant computations. Checkpointing. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the pains of developing a large complicated application where even a small bug like a misspelled variable name can result in having to rerun a large number of operations all over again. Dagger supports Checkpoint Restore, which when enabled will allow restarting a computation partway through by loading intermediate results from disk or some other storage medium. The user simply specifies a checkpoint function for saving results, a restore function for loading results, and Dagger does the rest. As we can see here, we define a checkpointing function, which simply takes the um, thunk ID, which is just a unique identifier of a computation, and uses that to construct the path where a value will be written once it's generated by that thunk. Similarly, we have a restore function, which at the same path, if it exists, will return that value as a dagger chunk. It's just a remote reference, uh, mostly an implementation detail and it pulls that um, value back into memory so that Dagger can use that instead of having to execute that thunk. Now, it's pretty simple to use these. You simply specify the checkpoint and restore function and you dagger.atspawn as usual. Now here, I've added print line calls within these very simple additions just so we can see when the thunks actually get executed. And what we would expect is that the first time that we run these, the thunks will get executed. We don't know what the results are gonna be. We don't have a file on disk to restore. So we have to actually execute the computation. So here we see we get A and B printing out, printing out and that's great. Now here we encountered an error because we accidentally used a variable that didn't exist. We used B1 instead of B. So what we can do now is without having to recompute A and B, we can simply say a plus b, 
And what will happen is that their values will be retrieved from disk and used to compute this new value. And this will work for arbitrarily deep chains of computations. Wherever it fails, you simply restart and Dagger will figure out the rest. So next, GPU programming. Like any good GP, uh, Julia library, Dagger also supports computing with GPUs. By using the Dagger GPU.jl library, you can write generic array operations in Dagger, and by adding one or two simple lines to your program, Dagger will automatically convert your arrays to and from GPU arrays, and thus execute your operations on whatever GPU you have available. I'm sure by now you find Dagger to be an exciting and easy to use interface for expressing inherently parallel programs. Before I end my talk, I'd like to share where we see Dagger going over the next few years. Distributed tables. Arrays are great, but for many workflows, a table is the preferred abstraction. We plan to develop a distributed table, compatible with the tables.jl interface, that will make it easy to operate on large tables in parallel without having to do anything more than you're already doing. Task and data scopes. Some kinds of data, such as opaque pointers generated by C calls or shared memory segments, can't be moved between CPU cores, processes, nodes, or even special devices like GPUs. To make it easier to work with such data, we intend to add an optional scope to a task to either denote the task itself or its result as being locked to a certain processor. In the example that I presented earlier in this talk, we can make the camera handle creation run in a dagger task with a process data scope so that the handle generated doesn't get moved to another process where the FFmpeg handle would be invalid. Mutable chunks. While Dagger is primarily a functional programming paradigm, we do want to support use cases where a portion of the DAG is best represented, or most efficient, with mutable data structures. We plan to make it possible to mark task results as mutable, which would prevent the scheduler from caching that data and would force all tasks operating on it to execute on the same processor. We can probably use the previously mentioned scopes mechanism to make this flexible. And finally, so much more. Check the issues on, Git, on Dagger's GitHub repository to get an idea for what the future might hold for Dagger. That's all I have today for Dagger, but thanks so much for listening, and I'm ready for any questions.